Loners Stay Together, an original mystery by Robert Napier, Chapter 2. So I don't know a damn thing about what my brother has been up to, except that he was suspended from teaching at the university about a month ago. He didn't say why. I'm standing in this, like, shabby doorway across the street from a real classy restaurant called Primrose or something. Not the kind of place I'd pick. Oh yeah, it's nighttime and it's raining. I'm tailing this guy Rupert. Paul Rupert. Scumbag. Not a judgment, just a description. Want more? He's a middle-aged, balding man with a very pretty not-his-wife opposite him, sitting at a table near the window, where my camera can see him. Rupert makes a joke. I don't know. I couldn't hear it. The woman laughs. I'm chewing on a hamburger and using my phone to take voice notes. I hate technology in general, but I also can't read my own handwriting. Not that the recording will be much better thanks to this eight bucks of mediocrity in my mouth. I tell my phone that it's 2058 hours. <laughs> Rupert's either funny as hell or he's paying for her company. She's pretty enough to charge by the pity laugh. I don't even want this burger, by the way. I always think I want things and then they're gross. Blah. I toss it on the street, but only the biodegradable parts. I'm not a complete monster. Back to Rupert. He gets up from the table and leaves alone. Go time. I tell my phone he struck out. He leaves the restaurant and crosses the street. I dip for my, the car. It's a company POS. Low gas mileage, low insurance, and low visibility. There's a parking ticket on the windshield. It must have been there from the day before. Anyway, I tear it up, because I'm a hard-boiled detective like you read about and I don't have time for parking tickets. Or the money to, you know, pay it. I mean, I couldn't pay for parking, like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? But I throw it in the car because parking Nazis notwithstanding, I hate people who litter. Shit, here we go. Phone, it's like 2106. He's moving again. I send a text update to my client. Time, location, and activity. Text responds, I know where he's going. But I have to follow Paul anyway because the client doesn't just tell me where he's going. Because that'd be too easy, I guess. And, cut to, exterior of some closed offices. Argent Creek Strip Mall, same night. I thought that would sound cool, like a movie script. Sorry, this part is kind of boring, but shit gets fucked quick. I pull up. A green and white placard sits in the front window. Tax insurance finance, $15 special. I track Paul Rupert as he scurries across the street and through the door beside the store window. I say scurry because I really don't like this guy, like he's a rat or a roach. But maybe that's being a prejudicial narrator or something. And we really need to build trust, you and I. He crossed the street. Like the little chicken shit dirt bag, he is... Sorry. I come to a halt on the far side of the street and get out of the car. I say to myself, Working late, Paul? Because this is his office, but it's been closed for hours. I wait a minute to let the scene breathe and assess what's up before following. Suddenly, Rupert comes running out the front door screaming, Oh my God! No shit. His face is dead white with absolute terror. He stumbles to his car and he peels out. I freeze because I have to decide between following Rupert and my sheer dumb-as-fuck curiosity. I go with the ladder and walk inside. Immediately, there's a stairwell. A clip art arrow on printer paper points up the stairs. I ascend. I want to hug the wall, but the wall is lined with faded photos of Rupert with anonymous clients. An above average amount of them are mature women. At the landing, the passageway turns sharply. Who designed this place anyway? Pause. This is a great opportunity to pull out my gun. It's a 4 inch.45 Colt Anaconda in leather. I never liked the recoil on a gun that size, but the weight is better for pistol whipping. Dual purpose. I like things like that. Forget what you know about me. I don't often pull my gun. I don't. But by the look that was on Rupert's face, something is truly amiss. There's this strange rumbling noise approaching from behind the corner. I take a peek. There's a short passageway leading to an open door. 
From the threshold, there's a signed baseball rolling toward me. As it passes through stray light, I realize it was smeared with blood. This is the source of the noise. I stopped the ball with my foot before it clatters down the stairs. It's weird how my mind wanders in moments like this. You'd think I'd be dialed in, like a cobra or something. But no. I'm out here daydreaming and thinking about epistemology and predetermination. And how do I truly know the ball was about to drop? And what might have happened if not for this knee-jerk reaction? Dead silence. After a hot beat, I creep towards the open door. Inside, total anarchy. The cheap furniture is demolished. The finance charts are slashed, files dumped, and computers smashed. I think to myself the place has been robbed, and that's why Rupert flipped. I relax a little. There are two offices. In the front is a waiting room, where I am now. But you don't have to follow in my footsteps or anything. Beyond that, through an ajar door, is a conference area labeled Fortune Telling Room. A bad pun for a corrupt business. From there, I hear this tragic moaning. My asshole clinches because now I'm like, oh, fuck. Somebody is in here with me. I cross the waiting room and hold my gun against my nose like a noob. That's when a nightmarish figure jumps out of the shadows. I manage to recognize her. It's Rachel Rupert, as in Paul Rupert's wife, my client who's been texting me. She's in her early 40s, androgynous but fit from hot yoga and Pilates. She's like a mad dog, teeth bared and eyes like mystery flavor gumballs. She knocks the gun out of my hand and goes for my throat. I flail around in a panic like I told myself I'd never do. Behind me, I somehow pick up a stapler, I think, and bash it on Rachel's skull. You know, I've thought about this moment a lot, sort of beating myself up over it. Seems tame now in comparison to some shit, but I think I got stuck in this loop where I recognized the woman, this sort of mild trophy wife type, who served me lactose-free milk and flourless cupcakes when I told her that her husband was sleeping around. And I never thought we'd be locked, you know, in this life or death struggle. And this dissonance kept telling me, no, no, don't hit the nice lady. What are you doing? Did you just bash her fucking skull in with a stapler? What? She reels back. I dash for the fortune telling room because all I can think about is creating space. Space equals time to think. Meanwhile, Rachel is totally calm, like there aren't six staples in her scalp. She looks at me, and I'll never forget this, she says. Fucking bitch. Like I just set a flourless cupcake on her glass top coffee table without a saucer. So it's night, and I'm in this closed strip mall tax office with a rabid former beauty pageant psychopath. The place is only lit by some cheap scented candles, the kind only a man would hastily buy when he forgot an anniversary. In the middle of the room is a conference table. At it sits Kathy Henderdink, 33 years old. She has been tortured close to death. Three matching kitchen knives are protruding from her chest. Her life force is ebb. It's ebbing from the... She, she's fucking dying. On the table in front of her is a fan of photographs, spattered in blood like someone rolled that baseball across them. That idea just occurred to me. I don't know if that's what happened. I recognize them, though, by their compositional elegance as the pictures I emailed to Rachel last week. I raced into the room and can't suppress a... What the fuck? Rachel charges at the door. Shit. I panic again and slam the door in Rachel's face and at least have the presence of mind to push the lock. Like, occupado, bitch. I can hear Rachel's hands tearing at the wood around the lock from the other side like she was going to rip the bolt out. I don't move because I'm thinking this is like the velociraptors getting in the kitchen. I lean my back against the door and pull out my phone. I enter the pass. The, the pass. The goddamn passcode. I swipe clear a notification. Notification. Update complete. Weather report. It's raining. And a new message from Brian. God damn it, is her phone dead again? And finally I get to the keypad as my phone dies because I was using the voice recorder all night. As this goes on, Rachel throws herself against the door and it's a cheaply made door. 
It's all I can do to keep myself from being pitched across the room. I scan for some means of defense, like a rolled-up newspaper or AK-47. There's a hundred-year-old set of blinds to the left of the table, and I'm willing to bet there's a window behind them. Then the scented candles flicker and I look up. There's a glass door on the other side of the conference table. Rachel looms from the darkness behind Kathy. Rachel is more composed now, and obviously more familiar with the office than I am. Her long hair is drawn back into a high ponytail like, Top bun, get it done. Her hands are tacky with blood, and she's holding one of those knives. Finally, my Tuesday night kickboxing classes kick in, and I remind myself I'm a badass. I look that psycho bitch right in the eye and say, Fuck off! Rachel comes calmly through the glass door. What are you going to do? She strokes a cut on Kathy's cheek. Kathy whimpers, more from fear, but also from pain. Ever watch something die? Says Rachel. If you watch closely, you can see the soul fly away. And maybe you can catch it. Kathy spoke for the first time. Please. Rachel. I wasn't... Ask Paul. Rachel smiled. Oh, Paul had to run away. He knew I was here. Like I was someone other than Rachel Rupert. No, mouthed Kathy, breathless. Dear, are you afraid? Yes. Thank Christ, police sirens filled the silence. I sidestepped the table and Rachel charged at me. I caught her arm and hip tossed her against the old blinds. The window audibly cracked and the blinds came down on top of Rachel. Streetlights flood the room. She's distracted. I did an honest-to-God judo chop on her wrist and she dropped the knife. Rachel struggled to untangle herself from the blinds. I went hard for a Spartan-style front kick to her solar plexus. Rachel is launched against the cracked window, which shatters everywhere. Still tied up in the blinds, she busts out the second-story window and hits the ground. I went to help Kathy. Don't leave me, she sobbed, tears just pouring down her face. I tried to comfort her, but I could hear Rachel and the blinds staggering in the street. You need an ambulance, was all I could think to say. Kathy dropped her head. It's too late. She blacked out for an instant, then her head popped up and she says, Who are you? I'm sorry, ma'am. We're closed. She grabbed my hand. No. I... Kathy stares at my hand. Fascinated, she momentarily forgets her pain. She says quietly, You're not married. What? Life is full of strange... Yeah, you could say that. Ever been drawn to... Wrong, over and over? Sure. I have no idea what she was talking about. I guess she was delirious from shock and blood loss. You can't... You have to hide. Wet cough. I slip my hand from her weakening grip. I'm afraid done something terrible. Going home. You mean Rachel? Yes. What about Rachel? Kathy shuddered and died right in front of me. Shit. I tried to look away but only saw those pictures. All of them are face up but one. I flip it. It's not one of mine. The picture is of Rupert's three children on a camping trip in front of a wide, thunderous sky. An image of impending desolation. The flashing lights of two cop cars wash the scene. Detective Edward Thomas, a football player turned policeman with buzz-cut blonde hair, walked with me along the alley. I know him. He quickly took my statement, which I've just given you. There are two more officers examining the heap of hundred-year-old blinds. Thomas repeats, What were you doing up there? Like he hadn't just heard every detail. I sum up nicely. I was hired to follow somebody for a few days. A guy called Rupert. He was helping some of his clients commit insurance fraud. Turns out he was sleeping around. I sold the pictures to his wife. Thomas writes it down and mutters, Classy Cassie. So now I've got Paul and Rachel Rupert. Blow me, Ed. Rupert's got nothing to do with the murder. He came here to get his dick wet. 
Thomas grunted as if not all men were transparent. What makes you so sure? I got a file on him 20 gigabytes thick. He's a petty fraudster slash philanderer. This is something else. How are their kids? Thomas smacks his lips because it's none of my business and he's the cop, not me. We're checking on it. He turned to an officer. Okay. Let's see her. Officer numero uno shakes his head and lifts the blinds. Broken glass drops from the slats. Rachel died from her fall. Only her psychotic rage allowed her a few twisted steps toward home. So where the fuck is Mr. Rupert? He ran, I said, soon as he saw what was inside. Thomas looks up at the window and shakes his head. Real catch. I don't know, I just lock in on those mangled blinds. I don't think he gives a shit. And there you have it, one shit show spectacular presented by Cassandra Loner. That was my last PI job. I killed my only client. Later on, people would say I probably saved the kids. I'll give myself a solid maybe on that. I sure as shit didn't save Catherine Henderdink. When Detective Thomas told me to go home, I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't face that empty, overpriced shithole of an apartment right now. Instead, I went to my empty, overpriced shithole office. Thomas also told me not to leave town, like where the fuck was I gonna go? I sat in the parking lot for 20 minutes. It probably looked like I was casing the joint, but I was just ugly crying. Well, if nothing else, I needed to grab a few things and drop off the company car. That's what I told myself as I went inside. I screwed around for about 45 more minutes, packing up some odds and ends, some spare clothes, desk trinkets, yeah, and crying some more. When all the leftover adrenaline was gone, I realized I was extremely tired. There was no use fighting it any longer. It was time to go home. I turned the key in the latch of the old brass knob. I'm closing up shop for the last time. This is it. Just because you're born to do something doesn't mean you get to do it. Not forever. You should be impressed. Not many girls my age have failed it so much. Hello, listener. My name is Robert Napier. I just wanted to say thank you for your support. If you enjoy this content or have suggestions on how to improve on it, please leave a like or comment. It would mean a lot, and I'd really appreciate it. Consider subscribing so you never miss an episode. Thank you.